are joined now by Aris Comparosos, uh, uh, Athanasio, <laughs> author of uh, Speculative Communities Living with Uncertainty in a Financialized uh, World. Aris is also a professor of sociology at the University of College London. Thank you so much, Aris, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Of course. So how would you define the term speculative communities? Okay, so <laughs> I start very time... broad, and then we'll, and then we d d dig deeper. No, that's <laughs> good. That's good. I ought to, and you know, this is a question that I get a lot. And uh, having written a whole book about it, I should be able to answer it in a few simple words. I'll have a go. Um, so, essentially, by speculative communities, I mean uh, I refer to uh, uh, groups of people that come together, they form bonds, they connect to each other. Uh, on the basis of a shared condition, a shared encounter, uh, we can say, with a world that is radically uncertain. So what unites those groups, those people, uh, isn't necessarily a shared coherent narrative or, um, you know, uh, uh, things that have a, a shared symbolic value, let's say, you know, necessarily a nation or, uh, you know, family or political, traditional political party membership and so on, but rather... Um, a, um, a feeling, uh, an imaginary uh, of uh, sharing this uncertain condition that they're all faced with a very unknown, unknowable future. Uh, they're in the throes of this chaos and they are together. And so all they, they have to do to survive is to speculate on, on that future. That's one way to answer at least this. Well, I would imagine that it's very different. I mean, and, and by imagine, I, I know it is quite different than like the economic portrayal of speculation. And yours is clearly more sociological. Um, economics is often treated like a religion when clearly it's just one tool in a in a or one arrow in a quiver, if you will, of mm -hmm. uh, history, sociology, philosophy, even if you want to go down that road, although the abstraction of that sometimes frustrates me. But like I, the, your sociological definition seems to kind of try to wrap its arms around the connection and not the kind of two dimensional economic vision of, say, speculation. Hmm. Yeah, I think you put it very well there. Um, I guess the origins of, of the term and of the, the project itself uh, lie in my own frustration with the discipline of economics. I must confess I'm a trained economist. That was what I studied for my undergraduate degree. Uh, I have since taken uh, quite a long kind of uh, U-turn. Um, but I, I have found myself back as a sociologist uh, interested in those questions around how economists uh, imagine the world, imagine the future, and how they seek to intervene in very uh, problematic ways. And so, yes, speculation in the world of economics means... Um, something very specific. It has a long history in, in how it's deployed. It has a moral connotation as well. There's a moral debate about what constitutes legitimate speculation in economics. So, you know, uh, economists often think of speculation as something that uh, fulfills a positive function in, in society in that it takes unwanted risk uh, off the hands of those that can't afford to take on that risk. So there is a kind of uh, there is space, there should be space for speculation we hear, right? Um, but of course, from my perspective, I wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to um, move away from a more deterministic definition of speculation that is, you know, taking risk and, 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 and gambling on, on uh, sort of, you know, on assets and asset prices to uh, a more imaginative act that we increasingly find ourselves uh, in a position of taking uh, an act of uh, an open-ended, uh, an act that betrays a more open-ended engagement with our uh, uncertain futures. Um, so yes, uh, it, it, is, it, it is, I think there is something, uh, I'm trying to retrieve, I'm trying to sort of uh, look at speculation from a slightly different perspective, from the perspective of the imagination, if you like, what is imaginative about speculation? speculation and also what is collective as we started, what makes us do it together in ways that are non-economistically deterministic. Yeah, I mean, and, and the kind of spread of speculation 
that you uh, you speak about also has its r ramifications uh, met, uh, felt in the political uh, spectrum, uh, in political speculation. I mean, we're, we're a political show, so that is kind of what piqued my interest in, in particular. But you, you make the case, really, that the global instability in the 21st century and even back before that, really, um, but particularly the 2008 crisis, Brexit, the rise of Trump, obviously, mm -hmm. even Narendra Modi in India, like how there is speculation and gambling embedded in the coalition behind them. I hadn't heard that put that way before, and I, I really liked it. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand on, on that part mm -hmm. of your thesis here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a very important part of uh, the argument I put forward, which is that uh, in a world, uh, especially the post-2008 financial crisis world, where uh, a lot of these big political shakeups are taking place, a lot of uh, folks, uh, patients, or belief in the promise of uh, neoliberal capitalism seems to be betrayed. You know, there is this rise of global waves of you know populism, um, Trump, Brexit are cases that I look at in the book, but as you said, you know, India, uh, the Philippines, Brazil, you know, Israel, so many cases of this brand of rather chaotic mix of mm -hmm. populist politics uh, is, uh, is on the rise. And so what I think characterizes, what kind of underpins this brand of populism on the rise is, uh, yes, on the one hand, uh, a kind of straightforward nationalism, a kind of right-wing uh, regressive politics that is uh, shares elements with the past. But there is also a, a new element of a more uh, speculative engagement uh, with the volatility of the political landscape. And rather than attempting to control the narrative and offer uh, a stable uh, no, uh, narratives of security uh, to voters, let's say, there, there seems to be an attempt to, uh, to weaponize that volatility, to even cultivate it further uh, for, for political gain. You know, the example that is very, uh, folks might um, immediately think of here, the, the, the origins often of this type of politics are placed in um, Putin's uh, advisor, uh, Surkov, like he he wrote this manifesto. I don't know uh, if you if you might recall it about um, how essentially there's no need to uh, control the narrative, but obfuscating it and, and throwing more and more information to confuse that is real the biggest political the greatest political weapon one can have. And so that in in a sense what I described as speculative politics, and this is the kind of landscape that we have uh, we have had over the last. Uh, over a decade or so uh, globally. So is it, I mean, so you, your contention is that like the nationalism in response to globalism to characterize these leaders at least, that that is too simple, that there is mm. a, um, a chaos kind of thrust into our everyday lives that has uh, like really been um, a function of the mm -hmm. rampant speculation in like the highly financialized world mm -hmm. that makes people feel like it's almost um it, it's almost a uh a, a, um an anti so not anti-social but like anti-society nothing matters um a, 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 a impulse that is embedded in that kind of nationalistic framework so it may it characterizes it a bit differently mm. yeah so a, a few things here i mean i think you you're right to say that there is something i think you're pointing to the cynicism uh of the of this that's the word attitude. i was looking for yes <laughs> <laughs> um which is uh, certainly true i mean there is something uh fatalistic right something about uh just uh, throwing oneself into uh chaos uh uh, as a as a response to the growing uncertainty that surrounds us. So two things that I should say here. I'm talking here about, as again, you 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 yourself just mentioned, um, a, uh, a a growth of 
what we call financialization of everyday life. So uh, following, especially following the, uh, I mean, this is something that has been going on for a few decades, but uh, intensified uh, even after the financial crisis. So the, the extent to which our everyday life decisions are dictated by financial um, uh, questions and, and the extent to which culturally also the way we consider ourselves, our choices of partners, our choices of home, our education are, um, are being articulated in financial terms. And so my argument is that we are kind of, uh, we are being nursed into the speculative environment. And so our very way of imagining the future becomes speculative, right? And so when to go to the question of populist speculation and Trump and Brexit, when we try to understand why folks vote for Trump uh, or for vote Brexit, to, to, uh, to offer the answer, to explain that vote only on the base of uh, the attraction of, of the nationalist uh, of the strength of nationalism, the pool of nationalism. That is, nationalism is, is what? It's stability. You know, it's a security, the symbolic security we have about belonging to a nation. But, but to exhaust this uh, analysis there, for me, is problematic because precisely of that speculative way of imagining that has been so pervasive in our time. And what does that mean? It means that when, you know, when Trump was doing his, uh, all his grotesque, uh, governed by chaos and waging war against the, uh, you know, uh, bu bureaucrats of the the, uh, the public service, the civil service, and uh, doing the the trade wars and so on. This chaotic, this cultivation of chaos has an openness. It doesn't bring stability, right? It's a narrative that is all over the place, and yet it doesn't. It seems to be reflecting the condition of uncertainty that we already are familiar with. So it's, it seems more honest, it seems more authentic, more representative of our reality, our experienced reality, than uh, a promise of, of stability uh, in, uh, that might be voiced, let's say, by uh, the liberal elites that are responsible for those very conditions of uncertainty. So does that make sense? So th there are these two yeah. sides of that coin, right? There is the stability, the security of nationalism, but there is also the open-endedness of this chaos that is... Um, that is, I, I guess, it taken advantage of, and it is, it is intentionally sort of weaponized by those forces, they're regressive forces. Yeah, um, and that, like, is embedded in, like, uh, just the trolling element of, oh my gosh, that makes me really want an espresso. I can, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm already drinking way too much coffee, but that looks I great. Know. I shouldn't be drinking it's my like fifth, fourth or fifth one, but anyway. <gasps> oh, you really you 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 have a, a stronger stomach than me, <laughs> I guess. But um, but uh, putting that aside, like, I it it is um, it does kind of feed both maybe human impulses in that way and, and politically, and I mean, I also wonder about the uh, you, you talk about enclosure a lot in your book. And how the increased kind of financial speculation is uh, uh, works in tandem um, with with enclosure. I, I also wonder how much the lack of public space and the enclosure on that front kind of fuels mm. this, where you become more atomized, and so mm. the risk it, it's it's. It, kind of untethered from any practical realities or communal realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think there is, this is now a very, um, it's a delicate and interesting matter here, how social space changes uh, through financial speculation. Um, I think what I, what I try to do, the way I would put it is that what is going on isn't exactly atomization. So I, have in the in the book the argument I make is that uh, what the the result of rampant financialization of our everyday lives has been a, a a disintegration of our traditional forms of community. Uh, the book, though, is hopeful, and and my yeah. argument is that um, there is another. Uh, story here. There is something, also something else that is going on, that, and that is there are forms of connection and collectivity that are being formed that don't look the way we expect them to look. There are forms of politics that don't look the way we expect them to look. Uh, and, and, and by that, so I look at 
some of those examples that I have in mind are, take place in virtual spaces. So I'm interested in virtual spaces of um, social encounter. So uh, cryptocurrency. By... <laughs> no, I'm, jo I'm joking. Crypto... But, no, but, but that's it's... a great example of, of yeah. like the, the we're in, you know, the end times of, of the speculative marketplace, but, but keep going. Totally, totally. And I should say when I was writing the book, the, the sort of uh, explosion of crypto hadn't really happened like in earnest, like in the, in the way that it has now. But absolutely, I mean, you know, there is, uh, actually, I do think that there is a very interesting social element in crypto communities again we tend to see it on the regressive end of the spectrum you know mm. the crypto bros uh types you know the short selling in the uh the events like the um, gamestop saga and so on you know like the the reddit uh kind of uh, you know the the, the q non elements within it there is a whole uh bizarre sort of mix of regressive elements that come together, but mm -hmm. they do come together. And I think the point I want to make is that they don't only come together to make profit, you know? They don't just gamble. They're, they're short selling or they're, they're crypto uh, and NFT type of um, gambling isn't merely to uh, in the chase of, you know, like uh, their version of the American dream, you know? I mean, there is an element of being part of something bigger, of being part of a community um, and of a community of contrarians as well. And, and there is an interesting collective element that I, <laughs> I think love that is often... I love that term, <laughs> community of contrarians. It's true. I mean, and they're heavily irony laden and also yeah. disconnected from everyone, but an in-group at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I think that there is then also, uh, but this is not the only type of connection. And I, I uh, give some examples in the book of more uh, progressive types of, uh, coalescing groups that coalesce around this condition of uncertainty and around this more speculative way of uh, acting. Um, and so I don't know if you want me to bring some of those examples up now. Sure. Or, uh, Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the one I, I love talking about is, again, one that I'm sure your, uh, your viewers will be familiar with is the uh, K-pop, this Korean uh, pop uh, band, uh, fandom communities. So these are teenagers all over the world. I mean, this is an extremely popular genre uh, way beyond South Korea where it began. And so you, you have uh, young folks there that uh, connect with each other in very uh, transient ways through uh, TikTok mainly or Instagram or, or other such means. Um, and they manage on uh, in, in recent political events to intervene in fantastic and spectacular ways. And what I have in mind here, of course, is the coordinated sabotage of the Trump uh, Tulsa Oklahoma rally, right? Yeah. Where, uh, <laughs> as, as you will remember, uh, this was, um, you know, a, 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 they managed to essentially have him speak in, a, in an empty stadium, right? Mm -hmm. By selling, uh, you know, you, knew, you know the story. They bought all those tickets with the intention of not showing up and so on. So, that is a, a speculative act, you know, that is a kind of a, polit a speculative politics, a, a politics that embraces this kind of more chaotic and uncertain moment with the intention, though, of sabotaging the very regressive elements uh, that are on the other side and they're playing the same game. So it, it's the kind of politics that tries to beat the enemy, you know, in their own game. And I, I think there's something to be... Um, uh, something to learn from that and not to just dismiss it as flippant. I agree. Um, and I, I, I think that the left could be better at engaging in that way because there is like, you know, uh, that is in many ways some of the language that's being spoken online, even though like I'm relatively young and I feel like I've already aged out of it. But um, but I, I do appreciate it for what it is. Um, well, Really appreciate your time today, Aris. Uh, the book is called Speculative Communities Living with Uncertainty in a Financialized World. We'll put a link to this in the podcast description to the book uh, and in YouTube and wherever you're listening to this and at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All the of best. Of course. <laughs>